Welcome to video 8 of Gamer to Game Developer Series 1. And this video is all about communications. So we have four objectives. The first is that when a new player joins the game, we need to assign the health of all players in that new player's game. And I'll explain that in a moment. Then our other three objectives are to implement the combat window, so who destroyed who, the communication window so that players can send chat messages to everyone else. And finally, implement a simple message that appears. So when some so-and-so player joins the game, a message will appear in everyone's chat window that so-and-so player has joined the game. Our first objective is to assign the health of players when a new player has joined the game for the first time. So what you can imagine is, is that Two players, A and B, they've already been in the server for a while, they've been shooting at each other, and player A has the upper hand, and they've managed to damage player B. But now we have a player C, with our current version of the game as it stands, joining into the game. What they will see is, they won't see the truth of what player B's health actually is. They'll see both players at their max health, because that's what's in the health and damage script. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a buffer in the health and damage script that keeps a record of the last health value. So when the new player joins, the buffer will be played out for several seconds, and then we select the last previous health value, and that gets assigned to the player. So by doing this, the new player will see every other player at their correct health value. It can take a few seconds, depending on the lag, it can take a few seconds for that buffered health to play out. So when a new player connects to that game, the first thing is that their spawn script is going to know that this player has spawned into the game for the very first time. And our assigned health script here, which will attach to the game manager, it only runs once, and it'll look at the spawn script, and it'll see that, okay, this player has spawned into the game for the first time. So I need to now cycle through, go through every single player who's in the game, in this new player's game instance, and look at their buffered previous health value. Select that buffered previous health value, and assign that as the player's current health. And by doing this, the new player will see all the other players at their correct health. All right, so the first step in objective one will be to edit the health and damage script so that it starts capturing the previous health value and keeps a buffer of it. To better illustrate what I was just talking about, I have here open a red team player and a blue team player in a game. So what I'll do is, as the red team player, I'll go over, shoot the blue player a bit so their health drops, and then I'll connect with a new player. So let me just fire maybe two shots. All right, their health has dropped. So now with another copy of the game open, I'll connect, connect, and say pick any team, blue team. And if I turn around, we can see that the blue player's health should not be full. So on the two existing players, we can see, see here the blue player, their health has dropped. And in the other game, we can see that the blue player's health has dropped because they were already in the game. But the brand new player doesn't see that. And that's what we're going to fix right now. So I'll just close these down. So we need to edit the health and damage script. I'll add a new variable. So down here where it says these variables are used in managing the player's health, I'll add a new variable called public float previous health. And I'll set it to equal 100. And then I'll create a new RPC. 
So all the way down here, I'll set up a brand new RPC. So right here within square brackets, RPC. And the name of it is update my health record everywhere. So update my health record everywhere. And it expects a float, so float health to do that. And all it does in one line, it says previous health is equal to health. And we're going to supply to this RPC the player's current health. So that way the previous health will capture the health and it'll be buffered. Now to do that, we scroll back up into the update function and inside where, so inside here, inside our update function, we can place it, yeah, I'll put it right here below the bit where if my health is less than or equal to zero, I'll place it here. I'll say now a new comment. If the player's health is different, uh, so if it's different from its previous health, then we'd update that health record. So if the player's health is different from their previous health, then update the health record across the network. The health record across the network and buffer it as well. So, and buffer it. So, the our if statement for this is if my health is greater than zero and network view dot is mine. So my health greater than zero and so two ampersands network view dot is mine is true. Then within that we will do another check. We'll check if my health is not equal to the previous health. So that means has the player's health changed? So if my health is not equal to the previous health, then that means we need to update previous health. So then we run our RPC, which is networkview.rpc, the name of our RPC. So I'll go back down, copy paste it, which is update my health record everywhere. So who will I send it to? I'll send it to RPC mode dot all buffered. And the RPC expects a float and what we'll supply is my health. So the current health. And that's it. We can save that. So it's quite simple really. All we've done is we've added a new public float called previous health. We then added a new RPC, and all this RPC is going to do is update that variable previous health when it's told to do so, and it requires a health value, and we make use of that RPC. So while the health, the player's health is greater than zero, and it only runs in our, so if we're the player, it only runs in our game instance. All the other players in our game, this bit of code obviously will not execute. And what it's looking for is that if our current health is different from that previous health variable, then we simply send out this RPC so that all across the network, our health, our previous health value will be updated. And that's important and we buffer it. And so new players joining the game, what we're going to do when we write that assign health script, a new player joining the game will play out the buffer and at the end of the time allowed for playing out the buffer, it'll select that previous health value there and assign that to this player's health in their game. Okay, so that does it for this very first step. The next step would be 
dealing with the spawn script. The second step of objective one will be to edit the spawn script so that it recognizes when the player has spawned into the game for the first time. So we go over to the spawn script and in it I'll add a new comment. So I'll write here that this script is accessed by the assign health script which we have yet to write by the assign health script to see if first spawn which is a new variable we're about to make is true. And so we'll add here a new variable so and a new comment as well used in determining if the player has spawned for the first time. And that variable is public bool first spawn and we'll set it to false. Okay, now we'll make use of it. Inside our join team window function, we're simply going to put whenever a player, when the player clicks on the join red team button or the join blue team button, it'll simply set that variable to true. So that means the player has spawned for the first time. And what will happen then is that when the assign health script, it'll come look at this spawn script, see that this variable is true by it being set here. And then, once it's carried out its own processes, it'll come back and set that variable to false. So let's put it here. First spawn is equal to true. And we can just copy paste that and place it in the other button as well and save what we've done. And these buttons, they only appear when the player has connected to the game for the first time. So it's appropriate here that we're having that variable first spawn being set to true when the player clicks on one of these buttons. So that's it for this step. The next step will be writing that assign health script. Our third and last step in objective one will be to write the assign health script, which will access our spawn script to figure out if the player has spawned for the very first time into the game. And if they have, it'll then capture all the players in their game and assign their previous health as their current health. We create a new c -sharp script, call it assign health, and open it up in mono develop. And in our summary, we'll write, this script is attached to the game manager. So this script is attached to the game manager. And this script accesses the spawn script to check if first spawn is true. Okay, now we'll start writing out our variables. So I'll copy over variable start and end. And within it, I'll write in three variables. So private, game object, and it's an array, red team players. Then private game object, also an array, blue team players. And finally, private float, wait time is equal to five. 
So we'll have our buffer play out for five seconds, and then we'll grab the previous health value that's present after five seconds. Now, if the game had been running for a really long time, or the lag is really high, then you would probably need a time greater than five seconds. And then you would probably need to build some sort of a load screen so that the player is left in a loading screen until such a time has enough time has elapsed for that buffer to play out. So maybe in a future series, I'll implement something like that. Wouldn't be too hard. All right, so now for the actual code, we're going to set up an I enumerator. So this this script is going to run a coroutine. So I enumerator. And the name of it will be assign health on joining game. Assign health on joining game. In our update function, I'll have there I'll start put in the start coroutine now so I don't forget it later. So start coroutine, assign health on joining game. I'll just write that, assign health on joining game. There we go. Opening, closing around brackets, and close that off. All right, so now we go back to the coroutine itself. And the first line is, I'll write the comment. Don't execute the code until sufficient time, well, until the wait time has elapsed. So don't execute the code till the wait time has elapsed. And that'll be yield return new wait for seconds wait time. All right, and I'll just put a gap there. Then I'll add a new comment. So what we need to do now, the first thing that we need to do is to access the spawn script on the spawn manager game object so that we can check if first spawn is true. So you can imagine that as a new player, this script is attached to the game manager. This script will be running and waiting to see if first spawn is true. If it is, then it'll finally execute the code that it needs to. And after it's done that, we'll make it so that this script will then disable itself. It'll stop running all the script because it won't need to. So a new comment. Access the spawn manager and find out if this is the first time the player is spawning into the game. So access the spawn manager and find out if this is the first time the player is spawning into the game. So I'll write here game object. The name of the variable will be uh, spawn manager is equal to game object dot find spawn manager. Then we'll have spawn script. I'll write in small the name of the variable spawn script is equal to spawn manager dot get component. And that is spawn script. All right. So now we'll do the check. If spawn script dot first spawn is true, then we will, the first thing that we will do is to find all the other players in the game will access their trigger game objects so that we can get their health and damage script. We'll first put them all in an array. So the very first thing that we should do is since we have their two arrays, we'll fill these arrays up. 
So I'll write here the comment. Find the trigger game objects of all the players in both teams and place a reference to them in two arrays. So find the trigger game objects of all players in both teams and place a reference to them in the two arrays. So red team players is equal to game object dot find game objects with tag and that tag is if we jump over to unity it will be red team trigger so if we jump over to the red player and we jump to the trigger game object we had given the name the tag name as red team trigger so that's what we need to find all right so find game objects with tag red team trigger and we do the same thing for the blue team players so the blue team players is equal to game object dot find game objects with tag blue team players oh sorry blue team trigger okay so now we'll have put a reference to each player in the game in these arrays so the next thing we need to do is to access that health and damage script on these players and then assign that previous health value as their current health value so we'll do that we'll write a comment here now that assign the buffered previous health value to the player's current health so assign the buffered previous health value to the player's current health and thing is if we didn't do this so I'll just put in there the comment that if we didn't do this then a newcomer to the game then they won't have an accurate picture of all the other players health so and they'd all they'd see is all the other players are at full health so the comment I'll write is if we didn't do this then a newcomer to the game would have an incorrect picture of everyone else's well of everyone's health as everyone would appear to have full health when that might not be the case so now the code for each game object red so I'm going to do a for each uh, loop so I'll go through each element in the array so for each game object red in that array red team players health and damage script and the variable name HD script is equal to red dot get component health and damage once we have that reference now we'll access it and change the current health so HD script dot my health is equal to HD script dot previous health. So you remember it was the health and damage script that's keeping the previous health buffered. So all we need to do is simply access the health and damage script and say that it's my health variable is equal to its own previous health variable. And we repeat the same thing for the blue team players. So once again, for each game object blue in blue team players, 
health and damage hd script is equal to blue dot get component health and damage and then assign the previous health value so hd script dot my health is equal to hd script dot previous health okay and after doing that the next step will be to set that first spawn variable back in the spawn script set it back to false so spawn script dot first spawn is equal to false and we'll now disable the script so i'll just write here a little quick comment that disable this script as we only needed it once as we only needed it once so enabled is equal to false and i'll save our script so let's go back up i can get rid of the start function we don't need that save it you know now that i'm sort of standing back and looking at the script there is something a little bit illogical about it and that is my usage of if spawn script dot first spawn is equal to true i've placed that check inside the coroutine but when i look at it i really should probably put this bit inside the update function because what's happening at the moment is that every frame i'm starting this coroutine and it's pretty unnecessary and i might even be defeating the purpose of having it wait for five seconds because since i'm running it so many times you can imagine that by the time first spawn is true there would have already been a coroutine you know launched like maybe four seconds beforehand or more than that where first spawn was false but now it becomes true and it, they, it won't have to wait for five seconds maybe it'll only wait for part of a second so that is a bit illogical on my part so what i'll do is i'll just cut it out i'll cut this bit out paste it into the update function indent that and close that off now there should be another bit that i need yes i'll need this and that i can place inside here and we don't need so many curly brackets so i'll get rid of one and remove the indent here with shift tab and i'll just tidy that up okay so this makes more sense now so what's going to happen every update in every frame it's going to find this game object the spawn manager that's no problem this bit of inefficiency is not really a problem because the player hasn't spawned into the game yet now once they have spawned into the game then this condition for spawn will become true and this script will see that and then it'll execute the coroutine which makes sense so the coroutine will only run once and only it only ever needs to run once so i'll just save that it looks good to me i'll save it and you know i've just thought of something right now we don't actually need to check the spawn manager at all and in fact we don't even need the update function there is a much better way and that is to make use of void on connected to server yeah, sorry for this it's something i've just thought of right now so instead of doing all this business of checking the spawn manager 
and then checking if the player has spawned for the first time. I mean, why not just check? It's It would make more sense that when the player has connected to the server, then they haven't spawned yet, but they have connected to the server, and all the other players will now be in their game. So why not then just run the coroutine and assign the correct health to each of those players, rather than waiting till when the player spawns? So I'll just copy the start coroutine bit, paste that in void on connected to server, which will run on the client, and just delete all of the update function, because this should work just fine. So I'll save that, and let's go test it out in Unity. Attach the script to the game manager. So we go over to the game manager, component, scripts, attach the assign health script. All right, we can save the scene and do file build and run, and we're going to need four copies of the game, including the editor. So I'll just hit build and run, and we'll, I'll then launch another two copies. I have my games launched, and as a blue team player, I'll now attack the red team player, drop their health a little bit, and now with my other copy of the game, I'll connect, jump in, join as any of them, and there we go, we can see that the red team player has the correct health level, which is what we were expecting, which is good. So I can do the same thing, I can disconnect, I'll disconnect from this one, and now this time, as the blue team, as the red team player, sorry, I'll attack the blue team player, drop their health down, go back to that other game, connect, connect, join as any blue team. Okay, and we can see that their health is at the correct values. Now, because the game has not been running for very long, and since I'm running on my own computer, there's no lag, so it doesn't take any time, really, for that buffer to play out. So the five seconds is more than sufficient. But if we had a laggy game, as I was saying, I mean, if the game needs to run for a long time, and if you can anticipate that there'd be quite a few players with poor ping, so they have um, not a very fast connection to your server, then it would be a good idea to have an, a loading screen that takes its time depending, say, on how long the level has been running and that particular player's ping. So that is something that I'll probably implement in a future series of Gamer to Game Developer. All right, so that's our first objective done. So now we can actually move on to implementing our combat window. In objective two, we'll implement the combat window. So we'll write a new script called the combat window script which is attached to the game manager, and it'll display a combat log showing which player destroyed which player. So if some player A destroys a player B, then what will happen is the health and damage script of player B will send out an RPC across the network to the combat window script, and the combat window script will see the attacking player's name and the destroyed player's name, and then draw that in the combat log. And what we'll also do is that over time, this combat log, the entries in it, they'll scroll down by a line. That way we'll only see the latest entries in the list in the combat log, and anything that's really old, it's not relevant anymore, so by scrolling it down, it'll disappear over time. So our first step in objective two will be to write that combat window script. We create a new script, and we'll call it Combat Window. And we open it up in Mono Develop. And in the summary, we'll type this script is attached to the Game Manager, and its purpose is to display the Combat Window. Well, 
Yeah, this is to display the combat window. And its purpose is to display the combat window or the combat log, I'll call it. And the health and damage script accesses the script. So the health and damage script accesses this script. Now for our variables, and of course we have yet to set that access up. So back for our variables, we'll copy the variable start and end. All right, our first set of variables, I'll put the comment that these variables are affected by the health and damage script. So these variables are affected by the health and damage script. And the variables are public string attacker name public string destroyed name public bool add new entry and we'll set it to false okay then our next set of variables will be well our next one is for it's the actual string that will get displayed in the combat log so the string displayed in the combat log in the combat log and it is called private string combat log is the name of the variable then we'll have another variable here which is the size limit so the size limit for the combat log this bit is purely optional, and I'll, I'll mention that a bit later. So private int character limit is equal to 10,000. Now the next set of variables will be used in defining the combat log window. So we'll have here used in defining the combat log window so public rect window rect private int window left which will equal to 10 private int window top will equal 150 private int window width which will equal 300 private int window height which will equal 150 and private GUI style my style is equal to a new GUI style okay now the next two variables will be used in scrolling the combat log entries so used in scrolling the combat log entries private float next scroll time is equal to zero private float scroll rate is equal to 12 
So every 12 seconds, the entries in our combat log will move down a line or two, whatever we set inside the script. Okay, so that's our variables. I'll say what we've done so far. And, and we'll jump over to the start function. And within it, I'll define that my style. So my style dot font style is equal to font style dot bold my style dot font size is equal to 11 my style dot normal dot text color is equal to color dot green And my style dot word wrap is equal to true. And that should be it for the start function. So we've defined my style there. Next, we'll create a new function, our void combat window function. So void combat window function int window id. So this function will be used by onGUI to draw that combat window log. GUI layout dot label combat log. So that string there, the combat log. So if we go up, this string combat log is what will be displayed inside the label and using the style my style and that's it it's a very simple function this one the next thing to do is the on GUI function and this is where the bulk of our code will sit so void on GUI okay and we want both the client and the server to have a combat window so I'll say here the comment, run this code for both the server and the client, for both the server and the client. So that means the condition is for this, is that this script should run so long as that game is not a disconnected one. So while it's disconnected, we only want the main window to show so that the player can join a server or start up a server. When they've actually connected to a server or set up a server, then it's okay for the uh, combat window, for the combat log to be displayed. If network dot peer type is not equal to network peer type dot uh, disconnected then window top is equal to screen dot height minus 350 and window rect is equal to a new rect window left window top so we're defining our the rect for our combat log window top the width is window width and the height is window height okay so the next thing to do is take into consideration now let's check if we need to add a new entry to the combat log. So it's the health and damage script that will access this script. And whenever a player has been destroyed, their health and damage script will send out an RPC across the network telling the combat window script. It'll give it an attacker name, it'll give it a destroyed name, and it'll set this add new entry boolean to true. So that is the condition that we'll look for. So when add new entry is true, that means we need to add a new entry to the combat log. And that new entry will be built from 
the supplied attacker name and destroyed name. So I'll write here the comment. If a player has been destroyed, then add new entry would have been set to true by the health and damage script. So if a player has been destroyed, then add new entry would have been set to true by the health and damage script. If add new entry is true, then we'll have here the comment that the string combat log it'll continue to expand while its length is less than the character limit. So our first check within so now if the condition that add new entry is true the first thing that we need to now check is whether the combat log is not too big already and this it isn't necessary to have this check at all so what i had here is i've defined a size for our our combat log it can only hold 10000 characters and what i want is that when it reaches because it's it'll be continuously scrolling it'll be adding characters that are not doing anything and so what I want is that after some time the log just simply clears itself and just places the last line inside it so it's really not necessary I don't know maybe if you had a several day running game some game that's been running for days maybe then maybe it might be important but anyhow I've just put in that functionality so I'll put here the comment the string combat log continues to expand while its length is less than the character limit. So the latest attacker and destroyed names are concatenated. So this is now what will happen if it passes. So if the combat log string is less than that character limit, then what will happen is that the uh, latest attacker and destroyed names will be placed in a single line showing that you know the attacker has destroyed so and so. And it will be put into the combat log string. And the previous lines will be pushed down a line to make space for this one. So the latest attacker and destroyed names are concatenated. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And the previous lines are pushed down a line. If combat log dot length is less than character limit then we'll carry out what we described above which is that simply combat log is equal to attacker name plus in quotation marks put three greater than signs that's what we'll use to symbolize as destroyed and plus again destroyed name plus within quotations put a slash so a backslash n and then plus combat log all right so what's going to happen here is this string combat log is going to have a bit of is going to have a new bit of text added to it and that will be attacker name plus these three greater than signs plus the destroyed name oh and i should leave a space at the beginning of that those greater than signs and at the end 
So that way the names aren't stuck against that. So plus the destroy name. And this slash n here is saying a new line. And then plus combat log. So whatever else was already inside the string. So that way it doesn't delete the rest of the previous content. It'll all still be there. And it'll look like when it's, when it's displayed, it'll look like the previous content was pushed down. It was scrolled down to make space for that new line. All right. So also within that, remember I wanted the contents of the combat log to also scroll down with time. So over time, it'll just empty itself out. So that way we'll always only be, when we look at the combat log, we know that that was the latest combat activity. So what we'll do here is I'll write a new comment. So a time for when the contents in the combat log should shift down a line. So a time for when the contents in the combat log should shift down a line. Next scroll time, so next scroll time is equal to time dot time plus scroll rate. Okay. So this will just increment, so that way when we actually have it scrolling with time, whenever a new entry appears, the next scroll time just gets updated. So that way, when we have a new entry in there, it won't scroll down until that full 12 seconds has elapsed again. And we'll simply say at the end of that, add new entry is equal to false. And outside this, we will say in the uh, in the alternative, if it's greater than the character limit, so we simply reset the combat log. We'll reset combat log, the specific variable, to stop it from getting too large. So if combat log dot length is greater than the character limit. Then we will say combat log is equal to attacker name. We can more or less just copy this same thing here. I'll just copy that, paste it in here. And I'll delete everything up to destroyed name. So this will simply replace all the contents of the combat log string with the last line of the attacker name and the destroyed name. So it simply cleared itself and rather than becoming totally empty, it just kept the previous attacker and destroyer, destroyed player name. All right. And now, finally, after all of that, I'd like to draw the window. So I can do it not inside here. I should do it outside. So outside, if add new entry is true. So here, window rect is equal to GUI dot window. I'll just give it an int ID of four. And the rect to draw is window rect. And the function to run is combat window. So combat window function. And what should I write at the top of it? I'll write combat log as the name of the window combat log. All right. And there we'll have our window drawing. Now we need to actually implement that scrolling effect. So after this line, we'll have here. 
So we'll have a comment saying that it creates, this creates the effect of the combat log scrolling down every few seconds if no combat destruction has happened recently. So creates the effect of the combat log, of the combat log scrolling down every few seconds if no combat destruction has happened recently. And the code for that is if time dot time is greater than next scroll time and add new entry is false, then combat log is equal to in quotations our backslash n, close that quotation, plus combat log. So it'll add a new line. And then we'll update that next scroll time. So next scroll time is equal to time dot time plus scroll rate. And we can save that. That should be our combat window. We can get rid of the update function. And I'll save that. So our combat window script should be done. That would be it for this step. We would next need to go over and edit the health and damage script. I'll just check in Unity that I haven't made any errors. No, I haven't, so that's good. So that means I can move on to the next step and edit that health and damage script. Our second step in objective two is to edit the health and damage script so that it informs the combat window script to add a new entry. We head over to the health and damage script. Let's just check out the summary. So we need to write here that this script accesses the combat window script. So this script accesses the combat window script to tell it to add a new entry. And we'll add a new RPC. So down at the bottom, We'll create a brand new RPC, so we'll say in square brackets RPC and the name of the RPC will be tell everyone who destroyed who. So tell everyone who destroyed who. And it requires two strings. It'll require string attacker, so the attacker's name and string destroyed, representing the destroyed player's name. And within this function, I'll write the comment that what we're he doing here is to access the combat window script in the game manager and tell it who destroyed who so that it appears in the combat window. So access the combat window script in the game manager and tell it who destroyed who so that it appears in the combat window. Now the actual code, the first thing is to find the game manager and then access the combat window script on it. So game object, game manager is the name of the variable, is equal to game object dot find game manager.
and then combat window and I'll name it the variable combat script is equal to game manager dot get component and the component to get is combat window now that we have access to that we'll write combat script dot attacker name is equal to the supplied attacker string and combat script dot destroyed name is equal to destroyed and then finally combat script dot add new entry is true so is equal to true all right and now we need to call that rpc so back up inside our update function and over here where we have each player responsible for destroying themselves we'll put in the rpc after this bit where the rpcs of the player removed we'll give them one final rpc to send which is, and I'll put there the comment, update the combat window across the network. So update the combat window across the network. So network view dot RPC, the name of the RPC, I'll copy paste it. It was tell everyone who destroyed who. And we'll send it to everyone, RPC mode dot all. And of course, it needs the name of the attacker and it needs the name of the destroyed player. So we'll put here my attacker as the name of the attacking player. And for the destroyed player name, all we need to do is parent object dot name and the reason for that is that this bit of script is running on the player who is actually getting destroyed in their game instance so that's why we can simply use parent object dot name and we had defined parent object back up here in the start function where we said that it's simply equal to transform dot parent dot game object all right, so that does it for our health and damage script. It'll now uh, update the combat window whenever this player is destroyed. So we can go in back to Unity and connect up the combat window script. So I'll save this one. To the game manager, we'll attach the combat window script. So we can select the game manager, go to components, scripts, combat window. I'll save the scene and build and run. And I'll also launch another copy of the game so that we can use one player to destroy the other. So I'll set up a server, connect to the server, and this time I'll put in a name gtgd, connect, Join as a red team player. Now with the other player, let's move that aside. I'll change the name to uh, test. Connect, join as a blue team player. All right, so let's have test destroy GTGD. Away we go. And yes, there you can see in the combat log that test had destroyed GTGD, which is good. And we can also see it in the destroyed players window as well that they that they were destroyed by the player test and you just saw there also that the line dropped down so every 12 seconds or so this line will keep moving down and that way it'll look like well that way outdated information will just be all pushed out of the combat log so let's repeat that so let's respawn and let's fire away at test Okay, and now we have that test destroyed GTGD. And the reason for that 
So if you recall that, um, oh sorry, that player 59 destroyed test. And the reason for that is that because we're using player prefs and it's on my own computer. So when I had joined the game, the second player was test. So player prefs got written over and the new saved name was test. Now there's already a player in the game called test. So it assigned the random name 59. All right, so we know that it's working now, which is good. And that completes this objective, which was to implement the combat window. In the next objective, we'll allow our player to send chat messages to other players. We're on to our third objective now, which is to implement the communication window. And basically what it is, is, is it's a window that'll appear in the lower left of our screen, and it'll allow us to see all the chat messages that players have been sending. Now for us to send a message, we press the T key, and it'll bring up this text field here. This will appear, and we'll be able to type in a message. So we can then just type in a message. So once we've hit the T key, this text field will appear, the cursor will unlock, and because of that, the player can't move, they can't fire their weapon, and so they can then type out a message. And when they've typed it out, they'll hit enter, and the message will get sent to all the other players. Now, if they don't want to type a message, if they press the T key and then decide that they don't want to send a message, then they just leave it empty and just hit enter, and the text field will disappear, and no message is sent. Let's go over how these scripts will work. The communication window script will look at the spawn script to see if the player has spawned into the game. And if they have, then the communication log will appear. If it's a server, then it'll also appear. The player name script will supply the communication window script with the name of the player who's running this game instance. So that way when they send messages, their name will be appended to the message. So it'll be at the beginning. The cursor control script will be looking at the communication window script constantly so that it doesn't attempt to lock the cursor while the player is trying to type a message. So the first step in objective three will be to write the communication window script. We create a new C sharp script. And we'll name it communication window. We open it up in mono develop. All right, in the summary, we type this script is attached to the game manager. So this script is attached to the game manager. This script accesses the spawn script to check if the player has joined a team. This script is accessed by the player name script. And this script is accessed by the cursor control script. All right, so now for our variables, I'll copy in the variable start and end bits. And our first variable will be a string, the player name, and we'll write the comment that this is supplied by the player name script. And it's a public string player name. 
All right, the next one, the next bunch of variables. These are used in being able to send a message. So these are used in sending a message. And they are private string. So private string message to send private string communication private bool show text box is equal to false private bool send message is equal to false public bool unlock cursor is equal to false. Our next set of variables, these are used to define the communication window. So these are used to define the communication window. And they are private rect window rect private int window left is equal to 10 private int window top private int window width is equal to 300 private int window height is equal to 140 private int padding is equal to 20 private int text field height is equal to 30 and private vector 2 scroll position and then private GUI style my style is equal to a new GUI style All right, so that's our variables. So I'll save what we've done so far. And now in our, the first function that we'll use is the awake function. So in that, so void awake. And the first thing is we need to, for our text field, we have to say, we have to use an instruction called input.eatKey press on text field focus. And we have to set that to false. So that way the player can actually hit the enter button and be able to send the message. So I'll write here, allow my pressing the return key to be recognized. when using the text field and that is input dot eat key press on text field focus is equal to false so when the text field is brought up we can actually type into it it won't eat the keys so you can type a message and then you can press enter and i'll also set a couple of things as well while i'm at it so I'll set the string message to send to an empty string. And I'll set my style dot normal dot text color is equal to color dot white. And my style dot word wrap is equal to true. 
Okay, so that's our awake function. Now for our update function. I'll put here if network dot peer type is not equal to network peer type disconnected. So that way this will run, this portion of code will run on both server and on the players. So the first thing that we need to recognize that we'll recognize in the update function is whether the player has pressed their T key. If they press T, then that means they want to be able to type out a message. So in on GUI that would tell it that it needs to draw the text field. So we're going to make use of the boolean show text box. So I'll write here the comment. If the player presses the T key, then set show text box to true. So if the player presses the T key, then set show text box to true. This will bring up that text field that will allow the player to type the message. So this will bring up the text field that will allow the player to type in messages. Okay, and I'll write here, if input, so the T key is going to be a get button down, and we'll define that key later on. We're going to call it communication, and the key that will look for is T. So if input dot get button down communication is what I'm going to name this control, this input, and show text box is equal to false. So that way, if the player is typing a message, and remember we use the T key to bring up the text field, so obviously if the player is typing a message, you know, like they're typing the, they don't want to attempt to bring up the text field again. So that's what we put in here, that show text box was, just check that it's false. And if it is, that means that text field isn't showing anyway. Show text box is equal to true. All right. Now the next thing that we also need to look for in our update function, so the first one is looking, it's constantly checking to see if the players press the T key to bring up the text field. The next thing it'll look for is whether the player is going to, is whether the player is hitting enter. And this will matter if the text field is showing. So if the player presses return, the comment, if the player presses return, and the text field is visible, then set send message to true. So I'll write here. If input dot get button down, the name of the that input will be send message and we'll define that later. So if input dot get button down send message and show text box is equal to true. So if those conditions are satisfied, then send message is equal to true. So that's our update function. We're merely using our update function as a way for looking for the player's key presses. And if they press the correct key, like if they want to send a message, uh, if, and they already have the text field open, then they can just press enter, and the send message variable gets set to true. It'll be our on GUI function that'll actually look for send message being true, and it will carry out the code to actually send that message. So the next bit of code we'll write is 
our own function will be the communication window function. So I'll write here void com log window int window id. And this is going to define how the window is drawn and what is in it. So I'll write here and it'll have a scroll bar. So we're going to do something slightly different. So I'll write here, begin a scroll view so that as, so that as the label increases with length, the scroll bar will appear and allow the player to view past messages. So if players have been typing lots and lots of messages, then we can just use the scroll bar and look at whatever the previous messages were, simply that. So the code, scroll position is equal to GUI layout dot begin. So GUI layout dot begin scroll view scroll position because it requires a vector two and the vector two that we're giving it is scroll position and GUI layout dot width is window width minus padding and I'll bring these things down to the next line and the next one is the height so GUI layout dot height window height minus padding minus five what we've just defined here is the area inside that window that will get scrolled so everything that's within this width and within this height in that window will be part of the scrolling so we can actually scroll all that all that uh, portion of the window. And the next line we'll write is the actual label itself. So it'll be contained within that scroll view. So GUI layout dot label. And the string is communication. That's the all of the communications that have been sent will be stored inside this one string. And it'll be my style. And I don't need to worry about the width or the height or anything. I have word wrap on, so it'll take up the space appropriately. And then I end the scroll view. So GUI layout dot end scroll view. So the only thing contained within the scrolling area in that size, the size of the scrolling area is defined here. Within that scrolling area is this label, which is displaying all of the communication messages. All right, so that completes it for the comlog window function. So I'll save it. And the next one is our on GUI function. So void on GUI. The first thing that we'll check that whether this is a connected game, so it shouldn't be disconnected. It can be either the server or the player, and they should be connected before this window can be drawn. So if network dot peer type is not equal to network peer type dot disconnected, then 
window top is equal to screen dot height minus window height minus text field height. So that'll position the window above an area and and below the window we're going to have the text field so that's why I've just said minus text field height to keep it above that area. Window rect is equal to a new rect window left window top window width so we're defining the shape of our communication log window and window height now we need to access the spawn script and check that the player has joined the team so they shouldn't be able to send any messages unless they've joined a team or unless it's the server so I'll write here access the spawn script so that we can check and actually to be more efficient I'll put this bit of code here so I was about to do you know find the spawn manager and then access the spawn script I'll put that in the in the awake function and I'll write in two new variables so I'll write here in the variables area so quick references and they will be private game object spawn manager and private spawn script spawn script Now in the awake function, I'll write that spawn manager. Or rather than in the awake function, I'll put it in the start function. Just in case the spawn manager hasn't been instantiated yet, since this is the awake function and the game manager itself is one of the first objects that'll appear and so is the spawn manager and just in case one of the two is appears before the other so in the start function I'll write spawn manager is equal to game object dot find spawn manager and spawn script is equal to spawn manager dot get component the spawn script okay now going back to our on GUI I'll just change that comment now so I'll just simply change it to don't display the communication log until the player has joined the team or it is the server and don't allow them to send messages either so we'll have here if spawn script dot mi on the red team is true or spawn script dot mi on the blue team is true and I'll just come down to the next line so I'll write here or network dot is server is true So if any one of these three conditions is true, then it's all right to draw the communication window. So I'll write here, window rect is equal to GUI window, oh sorry, GUI dot window 
We give it a window ID of five, window rect, com log window is the name of the function to run. And at the top of the window, I'll write communication log. All right. Now I'll begin a GUI layout area and the text field will be inside it. So GUI layout dot begin area. It's a new rect window left and I'll define that rect window left window top plus window height window width for the width and window height. Now we'll do the check to see whether that show text box is true. And if it is, that's where we'll unlock the cursor and we'll bring up the text field so that the player can type into it. So if show text box is true, so this is a comment, so show text box is true, then allow the text field, well not allow, then show, then show the text field that will allow players to type messages. If show text box is true, I'll set unlock cursor to true and also just unlock the cursor right here. So screen dot lock cursor is equal to false. So by having the unlock cursor is equal to true, our cursor control script will look at it, see that it's true, and it won't attempt to lock the cursor. All right, now the next thing is we're about to draw that text field, but we're going to give it a name first. Because what I want to happen is that when the player presses the T key, the text field will appear, and immediately the text field will have focus. So the um, cursor will appear inside the text field, and the player can immediately start typing a message. They don't need to bring their mouse in and actually click in the text field. So we'll give the text field a name and then find it using its name. So they'll write there the comment. Give the text field a name so that it can be found. So give the text field a name so that it can be found with the GUI dot focus control method. So we set say here GUI dot set next control name is and I'll just call it uh, my text field. And now here, I'll actually draw now the text field and what will be the string that it'll show and the string that it'll, it'll write to. So message to send is equal to GUI layout dot text field message to send. And it needs a width as well. So the text field will have a width of GUI layout dot width and that width will be window width. All right, and I'll close that off. So now that we've given the GUI text field a name, we can immediately find it with focus control, and that'll allow the player to immediately start typing. So I'll write here the comment. Give focus to the text field so the user 
can immediately start typing without having to click. So without having to click their mouse cursor on the text field. And that'll be GUI dot focus control. And the name that we had just used was my text field. So I'll just copy it, paste it. And that's it. So once the user has typed out a message, they'll want to be able to send it. And that's where they'd press the enter key, the return key, and that gets recognized back up here in the update function. So the send message variable would get set to true. And on GUI, we'll look for that. So if send message is true, then it will send it. So the code here is if send message is true, then what will happen is we'll only send a message if the text field isn't empty. So if it's empty, it means that the player didn't want to send a message. So I'll write here the comment that only send a message if the text field isn't empty. If the text field is empty and the user presses return, then that means that they don't want to send a message. And and the text field should be hidden. And the text field should no longer display. So we'll put here, if message to send is not equal to an empty string, Then, if network dot is client is true, so if it's a player, as that'll determine what type of name to send. So if it's the client, then we'll also send the player's name as well as part of the message. Now, if it's a server, then the server, then just a word saying server, so that way all the players know that, oh, okay, the server sent this message to us. So if network dot is client is true, then we're going to send off an RPC. So we'll write that RPC. So outside our on GUI function, we will write RPC void send message to everyone. And it requires two strings, string the message that it needs to send. So string message and string p name. So it requires the message that's going to be sent and the name of the player or just the word server. We've just put that as p name. And now within our RPC, I'll write here the comment that this string is displayed by the label in the com log window. This string is displayed by the label in the com log window. And that string is communication is equal to p name plus quotation, put a space, put a colon, another space plus message. So the message that was just typed uh, into the text field, and that's what gets supplied here to this RPC, plus 
in inside quotations, a backslash n, so a new line, plus inside quotations, another backslash and new line, and plus communication, so all the previous communication that was inside that variable. All right. So that closes that RPC. Now going back up here, inside on GUI at the point when we're about to send the message. We'll write network view dot RPC and the RPC is send message to everyone. RPC mode dot all, so send it to everyone and it that rpc requires the string so message to send which is what was inside the text field and also the name of the player so player name so this rpc is being sent by a client which is a player now the other situation if it's the server sending a message so if network dot is server is true, then we can just copy this RPC right here, this instruction, and paste it below. And instead of player name, now we'll just write within quotations server. And that's it. So now outside of this if message to send block, well, is not equal to uh, an empty string. So if it's not equal to an empty string, the next thing to do is to set send message to false so that the message doesn't continue to try and send. So set send message to false so that the message doesn't continue to send after having pressed enter, after having pressed return. So we simply say send message is equal to false. All right, the next one is set the show text box to false, so that variable to false, so that the text field is hidden. So set show text box to false so that the text field is hidden. So show text box is equal to false. And you'll notice here that if the player has brought up that text field and it's empty and then they press their return key, the variable send message will get set to true then it'll do this check. It'll see that if message to send is not an empty string, but in this case, since the text field is, it'll ignore this. It won't send any RPC. Then it'll just, I'll just proceed outside of this if statement. It'll then simply set send message to false and show text box to false. And upon setting show text box to false, this whole bit of code above no longer executes, so that text field doesn't draw. So that's very, it's a very simple way of not showing the text field anymore. And we're nearly done. Still a little bit more to go for the script. We'll now set, we'll put unlock cursor to false. And the next thing we'll do is to set that send, the message to send, we'll set message to send string to an empty string. So that way when the text field is brought up the next time, it'll be empty. The player doesn't need to delete the message. So I'll just write here, reset message to send so that the user doesn't have to manually 
delete the text when they bring up the text field again. So when they bring up the text field again. And that's simply message to send is now equal to an empty string. And after all of this, remember we're doing it all inside a GUI layout area. This text field is being drawn inside that area that we've defined. So now we need to end that GUI layout dot area. Well, not dot area, but that area. So GUI layout dot end area. And that's it. And that does complete the code for our communication window. So that was a lot. So let's save it. So very briefly, what it does is in the awake function, we set it so we put in this eat key, press on text field focus, we set it to false. So that way the player can actually type stuff into the text field when it appears. Then inside our update function, we're simply using that as a way to recognize whether the player wants to type out a message or send a message. It simply is used to set two booleans to true when required. Then our comlog window function, that's used to define what's inside the window. Then in our on GUI, we start by drawing that window, well, s defining that window, sorry. So that's where we define the rect. We're not actually drawing it just yet. In the on GUI function, if the player is connected to a game and they've spawned into the game, or if it's a server, we draw the window. We then begin an area inside of which we'll have the text field. We unlock the cursor and we just use this bit of code here to set the name of the text field so that we can find it and give it focus immediately so that the player doesn't have to click into it to type out a message. And if in the update function the player has pressed enter, it'll recognize that the player wants to send this message, so it'll set send message to true. And when that happens, our message to send variable, if it's not empty, it'll get sent to all the other players. So they'll see a message appear in their communication window. Now, if they didn't want to send a message and they had brought up the text field, then they just leave it empty. And the show text box will simply get set to false and the text field will disappear. So it's quite a simple script, actually. It's just a lot of typing in it, that's all. So I'll just go over to Unity, just check that there are no errors. And that looks good, we don't have any errors. So that means we've done this step. We're not done yet, we still have to edit the player name script so that it supplies a name to this script. And we need to edit the cursor control script so that it will lock the cursor appropriately. In step two of objective three, we'll edit the player name script. Okay, so I'll open up the player name script. And in the summary, I'll just write there that this script accesses the communication window script. to supply it with the player's name. And we only need to make a small addition to the script. So down here in the update local game manager function, we'll add a, two lines of code. So I'll add here first the comment that supply the communication window script with the player's name. So supply the communication window script with the player's name. And that is communication window com script is the name of the variable here is equal to game manager dot get component
communication window is the com component to get. And then in comscript, dot player name is equal to p name. All right, and that's it. I'll just save that. Oh, I just made a mistake right there. I'll just get rid of that. It's supposed to be inside there. Communication window. All right, now I'll save that. And that's our player name script edited. All it'll do is it'll, it'll just access the communication window script and supply the player's name to it. Our last step in Objective 3 is to edit the cursor control script. Alright, so we open up the cursor control script and in the summary, alright, this script accesses the communication window script. And we'll add two new variables. So private, game object, game manager, and private, communication window, com script. Now within our start function, we'll assign the reference to the game manager. So game manager is equal to game object dot find game manager and com script is equal to game manager dot get component and the component to get is communication window all right so now inside the update function where we have if multiscript.show disconnect window is false, we'll now have, we'll extend that to say and comscript dot unlock cursor is equal to false. So we're extending what this script is covering now. So now it looks at the multiplayer script and it'll look at the communication window script to just check that the screen, that the cursor should remain locked. And likewise down here, we'll also put in and comscript dot unlock cursor is equal to true. So while this condition exists in the communication window, this script will keep the cursor unlocked. All right, so let's save that. And that completes what we needed to do to the cursor control script. So now we can jump over to Unity and start getting ready to build the game. The first thing that we'll do is click on our game manager and attach the new scripts, so component scripts communication window. All right. And now the next thing is we had those two inputs, which was, let's go back to our script, the communication window script. And let's have a look at them. One of the inputs was communication, and this is for the T key. And the other was send message, and this was for the return key. So we need to define those now. So back in Unity, we'll go to Edit, Project Settings, Input, and we're going to create them here. So I don't need all these fire two, three, jump and all that at the moment. No, I do need jump. So I'll change. I don't need fire two though, so I can just recycle this. So fire two, I'll change it to communication. Communication. So I do have to get the spelling right. Otherwise, it won't get recognized. And the positive button is T. And there's no alternative positive button, so I'll delete that. And that should be fine. And now for Fire 3, I'll change that to, what was the name of it? 
send message. I can just copy paste and make sure I don't make a mistake. So I'll copy paste that in. So now it's called send message. The positive button is return. And there shouldn't be an alternative positive button. Well, I don't want one. So I've deleted that. Okay. So I'll save what I've done so far. Save the scene. And let's give it a try. Let's go build and run. So file, build and run. Okay, and I'll set up a server. And, oh, and you can see in the server that we have a new window now, the communication log. And if we press T, yes, see the text field appears when we press T. And we can type a message, but there's no point at the moment. So I'll just press Enter, and the text field disappears. So let's connect, connect connect as a player. All right, and our player also has a communication log. So let's test it out. So if I press T, the, you see that the cursor unlocks, the player can't move, the text field has appeared. So let's type in a message. I'll say test message and press enter. And we can see there that the name of the player and the message has appeared in the communication log. So if we jump over to the server now, we can see that the server has received the message. And if we had other players open, they too would have received the message. Only existing players, of course, receive the message because our RPC mode is all, it's not buffered, and it's not necessary for it to get buffered either. So let's keep typing messages until, so let's write T, T, um, just type any old thing until the scroll bar appears. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, so we have the scroll bar now. So you can see that I can just scroll through the messages. So maybe let's bring up the script. I'll minimize this. So first of all, the name that we see there in the communication log that was supplied by the player name script. And because of that, the communication window script is able to print that inside this label. So let's start from the beginning. First of all, our text field is able to take key presses because we have this false. Then when the player presses the communication button, which we know is the T key, that means they want to send a message. And then in our on GUI function, it'll see that the variable show text box is true. And because of that, it'll cause that text field to appear. Now I should mention about the scroll position. So you remember here our scroll view. So if you notice, the GUI layout.width is the width of this window minus padding. And that's what allows us to have this entire area as a scrolling, well, the width. And we also said the height minus padding. And that's why the scroll bar fits nicely inside the window as well. So if you play around with that, you'll, you can see what will happen. And our label sits inside that scroll area. And that's why we're able to scroll it. Let's see what happens if I type a really long message. So let's just make it extend on and on and on. Press Enter. And that's the word wrapping. It allows the message to extend over more than one line, which is good. So we can see that our communication system is working. So the next thing would really be, it's just an additional feature, is that when a new player joins the game, a message just gets sent to everyone in their communication log that so-and-so player has joined the game. So let's go ahead and implement that. I'll shut everything down, exit, shut down, and let's go on to that last objective. We're on to our last objective now, and it's quite a simple one. 
When a new player joins, we want their communication window script to send out an RPC to all the other players telling them that this new player has joined the game. And this will happen when the player name script has supplied the name of that player to the communication window script. So there's only one step to this and it's pretty simple. We just need to edit the communication window script. So I'm in the communication window script and I'll just add a new variable. So I'll write here the comment used in informing all the other players that a new player has joined. And it's a boolean, so it's simply public bool tell everyone I joined is equal to true. Then we just need to add a new RPC. So this RPC, we write here RPC void tell everyone player joined is what I'll call it. And it requires one string, which we'll call P name. So it just requires the name of the player. And what we'll do is to have that the same variable communication will get that name and a specific message. So let's just type it out. Communication is equal to P name plus in quotations, leave a space has joined the game. Full stop, end of quotation plus within quotations, a backslash and an end, so new line, plus another new line, plus communication. So all the previous text that was already inside that variable. And that's it for the RPC. The next thing that we need to do is go back to our update function and change that. So outside of this bit where it checks whether uh, the player is a connected one or not, we simply add, we're going to, when the player joins for the first time, we'll tell them that they have just joined. We'll inform everyone that a new player has joined. So we only send the RPC, obviously, if it's a client running. And also we should only send that RPC if the player name variable is not empty. So while it is empty, it means that the player name script has not yet supplied the player name. So we shouldn't fire off this RPC until then. So I'll write the comment. When the player joins for the first time, when the player joins for the first time, tell everyone that they have joined tell everyone that they have just joined and and only send an RPC if it is a client and only send an RPC if it is a client and also and the player name variable is not an empty string. So, and the player name is not an empty string. All right, so now the code. If network dot is client and tell everyone I joined is true and player name is not equal to an empty string. So if all those three conditions are satisfied, then we'll send off that RPC. So network view dot RPC. And I'll copy paste the name of the RPC. Tell everyone player joined.
and send it to everyone rpc mode dot all and it requires the string so player name and that's it for that and one more further line which is just set that boolean to false tell everyone I joined is equal to false so once this bit of code has executed it will never execute again it only needs to run once and we're using this boolean tell everyone I join to control that because we set it to true back up here in the variables. Alright, so I'll save our script and that should be it. We should be able to build and run the game. So we jump over to Unity, File, Build and Run. And I'll set up a server this time in the editor. So I'll set up a server. I'll connect and watch. So I'll put in a name, gtgd, connect, join which team, any, join the red team. And there we go. Everyone's got the message that gtgd has joined the game. And it looks like I've put in a bug into our code, actually, because my cursor is not unlocking when I've opened up the menu, the escape menu. So you see, if I press escape, I'm still able to move around, which is totally wrong. And my guess is I've made a mistake inside the cursor control script. So I'll just minimize this and go to our cursor control script and let's have a look at the script this is the cursor control script and I can see what the problem is see I said here this is the condition for unlocking the cursor so keeping it the lock to false I said and com script dot unlock cursor is true so I probably need to send that to set that to or because I needed to set that to uh, or because at the moment with and they both have to be true. So I'd have to open the disconnect window and also press T and unlock the cursor to unlock the cursor. Press T, bring up the text field to unlock the cursor. So let's try that out. I'm not saving it, I'm not building and running. I'm just gonna try my theory that, okay, so if I press escape, it's not unlocking. If I press T, there we go, it unlocks. So because both the conditions are satisfied. That's silly, of course, that's a bug that I just put in there. So I've changed it to or now, I'll save it, and I'll go and build and run again. So file, build and run. Okay, I'll do the same thing. I'll set up a server, start my own server, connect to it, join as a red player. All right, now let's press escape. All right, so it's unlocking the cursor as expected. And if I press T, yep, it unlocks again, and I can type a message that all is working okay. Yep, and that is good. So that was pretty simple. And actually, why not, just for the sake of it, I'll open up another copy of the game. And I'll connect. I'll change the name as... Test. Connect. And join as a blue team player. And we can see that Test has joined the game. And we can see that they have appeared there too, which is good. Let's just try t typing a message. So just like message, any old thing. All right, so test has sent a message. The server has gotten that as well. 
What about the other player? Yes, GTGD's also gotten the message as well from test. So our system is working, so that's good news. We fixed a little bug there as well. So we did a lot in this video. We first of all went ahead and we implemented our assign health script so that new players joining into the game would see the correct health of the other players in the game. And the truth is I'm not so happy with this buffering solution. So probably in the next series, I'll implement a different solution for assigning players health. I'm probably, I'm thinking of making use of our player database and our player data class as well. And getting rid of the buffering, uh, using buffering altogether. So that'll be in the next series. I've got a couple of ideas for that. And then we also went ahead, we implemented the combat window as well, so that we could see which player destroyed which player. And we implemented the communication log so that players can send chat messages to each other. So we really did do a lot in this video. And well, this probably isn't a happy news because the next video is probably going to be much longer than this one. And I prefer having shorter videos. I'd much prefer having a shorter video, but I'm sorry to say that the next video, video nine and 10 are both likely to be close to the three hour mark when I make them. That's what my, I'm feeling because they have a lot of scripting involved. The next video will be about scoring and having a score table and the video after that will be about being able to win a match and then reloading the level. And they might sound like simple things, like when we press tab in a game and we see the scoreboard, It's we don't even think about it. We see the scores listed there, but there's actually a lot of scripting happening in the background. So in the next video, we'll nut out all of that scripting. Once that code, once those next videos are done, it'll be the main backbone of our game will be in place and the videos to follow will be much more, well, leisurely maybe. Anyhow, so thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.